Welcome, listeners, to episode 13 of the Ubered podcast. I'm your host, Evan Kale. For four years, I was a full-time Uber and Lyft driver in Minneapolis, St. Paul. I gave more than 8,000 rides in that time period, and I wrote two books on the subject. Ubered, my life as a rideshare driver, and Ubered 2, both available on Amazon. As I have mentioned before in this podcast, what I do is I go through my books with a particular theme in mind, and I find all the stories the fifth the bill of the theme I'm going to do for the episode. Well, as I was doing this, I started to notice that there were all these stories that were very funny, but they didn't really fit into one genre or another. So for this episode, this episode is called Too Funny. This is the shit. It's just really funny. I would be pulling away, laughing my ass off and thinking to myself, oh, I have got to write about this. This is just too funny. So jumping right into this, trip 1986 it's called the uber bad joke if this is your first time joining me on the uber podcast well first off i don't know why you would pick episode 13 and not start with episode one but if it is something to know about me i have a very dark sense of humor that is not immediately relatable with other people in fact we'll talk about this in one of the upcoming stories i joke that i can bite the ears off of people so example here are some things that i could craft the joke out of Lou Gehrig's disease. Lou's attorney has just finalized his last will and testament, and he's leaving him bedside to die. And he turns and he says, well, Lou, look on the bright side. At least they'll remember you. Or here's a joke that's more current event based. How did Jamal Khashoggi's wife take the news of her husband's death? One piece at a time. Another one is the aristocrats joke. If you are not familiar with the aristocrats joke, you should probably look it up. It's, you'll either think it's the funniest fucking thing in the world, or you will think it is not funny at all. This is old joke from Hollywood. It's been around forever. They actually made a documentary on it in 2005, and <laughs> the documentary is amazing. Uh, the premise goes a little something like this. A man walks into a talent agent's office with his family. He says, sir, we have an act for you. The talent agent says, okay, well, show me the act. And then you kind of just build on what the man does to his family. He usually rapes and kills them. The whole novelty of the joke is to keep it going as long as you can. So one time in college, I once told a version of the aristocrats joke that was half an hour. Anyway, so these are a few samples into my humor. Just some light samples. I mean, dark humor isn't my only humor. Like, I like, I even like dad jokes. They're like innocent jokes, too. But by and large, I mean, if I'm going to be cracking a joke, it's going to be a bad one. I even have 9-11 jokes. You guys want to hear my favorite 9-11 joke? Nine times out of 11, you shouldn't make a 9-11 joke. I had some more, but all my 9-11 jokes just went right out the window. The point that I'm trying to get at here, or what I'm, what I'm building toward, is my humor wasn't always relatable to other passengers. And usually, I could pick up on it just by looking at a person. Like, I don't want to say I can visually profile somebody, but I can usually visually profile and tell if my humor is going to hit or not. So if I got the sense that it wasn't going to hit, I would be as bland and polite and, like, you get one-word answers. I don't even want to risk saying something that might offend you. And this was especially true with foreigners, because foreigners did not understand my sense of humor at all. So the story here, I'm in Edina, the suburb where I'm from, and I have picked up this Indian woman from, like, a fabric store, and I'm taking her back to her apartment in Edina. And as we are driving back to her apartment... We are going through a familiar part of Edina that I spent a lot of time in as a kid. My grandma lived in this area, and so this this apartment building that I dropped this woman off at is, like, pretty much across the street from my grandma's old house. So I said, oh, oh, hi, I haven't been over here in a while. My grandma used to live over here. And she, this woman in my back seat goes, oh, that's so lovely. Which one? And I pointed out to the house, and she goes, oh, okay. And is she still there now? And just, I had... In the moment, I had forgotten who was in my back seat, and I said an answer that I would say to my friend. Like, I said, a, I cracked a joke. I go, no, she's six feet under. And the woman looked at me, like, kind of puzzled. She goes, what? And I go, she's dead. And, like, I said it, like, kind of funny. And there's just, there's dead silence. And I look in the back seat, and this woman has this expression on her face that is just appalled. And she gets out, of, she just, without even saying goodbye, she goes to get out of the car. And I go, have a nice day. And then as I'm driving away, I'm reminding myself, your humor is not relatable. Don't crack jokes, especially around foreigners that aren't going to get it. But oftentimes, it wasn't my humor that wasn't the only unrelatable part. Mostly it was just me. I'm just a weirdo. And it's more, I'm just not like, I'm not like a, tra a traditional Minnesotan. 
The traditional Minnesotan is a passive-aggressive, highly reserved, timid creature that struggles to directly express themselves. They don't do small talk, and if they do, it's only about the weather. They don't like confrontation. They aren't very exciting. They don't dream about abstract things. They're not, like, they're not a charged personality like I like to think I am. So these kinds of people, I mean, I was, like, I first started struggling with this when I was a kid. They just wouldn't get me. So much so that it was, like, you know, I felt like I was from Mars for a long time until I kind of started to realize that, like, as I traveled more and got out more, that, no, that's just people from Minnesota. They're just kind of lame. So these people, like, these people I've described where I can bite their ears off, I call them type B Minnesota nice personality because I can I can visually look at them and tell that they are going to be of this subgenre of people, this, this group that is so alien from me and my personality. Basic conversation itself is hard. Even if we're talking about something like the weather, they would get in the car and they would start asking about me and I wouldn't even want to tell them about anything pretty much because like every avenue that the conversation could turn is going to be a rock that they could unturn and see that I am, I am this thing that they're not going to click with at all. Or other times like I had to watch what I would say because if I said one like off color joke without realizing it kind of like the previous story. Not only could I get, like, a bad rating, I mean, it could it could just steer the conversation into something really ugly, especially if somebody misinterpreted something that I said, like, I'm trying to crack a joke. And just in this thick-skulled mentality, they, like, a joke went in one ear and out the other, and all they took from it was something serious, and they're offended, or something like that. Can't, like, off the top of my head, I can't think of an example, but, like, I wouldn't crack jokes about, like, abducting children or anything like that. It would be something, like, far more benign. But after uttering it, whatever it was that I would say, I would, like, there would be, like, a long silence, and I'd look in the rear view and think, okay, nope, it's one of these, fuck. Other times, I played it to my advantage in that I just did not like somebody, and I wanted to mess with them. And so, oftentimes, I could, very easily, just by saying, like, little cryptic creepy things. Like, example, this one day, it was a hot day, and I had on, like, a long sleeve t-shirt and black jeans, like, I had the AC on. But this woman got into my car and, like like I said, just was not in a good mood. And I looked at her and I could immediately tell. And she goes, well, it's, it's kind of hot out. Aren't you hot in that? And I just go, with a heart of ice, one is always cool. Watching this woman's expression form from, like, neutral to creeped out and puzzled, like, like within a second of processing what I said, that cheered me up. But that's not the story I want to talk about. So... The most relatable story with what I'm trying to get at here is trip 3,218, and it's called Fragile Psyche. So it's, I believe it was the Jameson Ball or something. Jameson Whiskey. So fun fact about Minnesota. Minnesota drinks the most Jameson Whiskey outside of Ireland. I have no idea why that is. Anyway, so Jameson Whiskey was throwing a ball or like a party for everybody who's in the service industry. At least that's what customers were telling me. So... I had to deal with, you know, mainly I like, or usually I liked driving service industry people because I tipped. This night I fucking hated it because they were all three sheets to the wind drunk. And once this, this Jameson ball got out, they were running like all over the metro, like from north to south, east to west. So I was just doing a lot of driving, a lot of back and forth with a lot of drunken drama. And for, I think it was on like a Wednesday night or something. It was a night where otherwise it would have been benign clientele. There wouldn't have been any issues. So... My patients were rapidly thinning. Well, fast forward to the end of the night. I am in St. Paul, and I pick up this woman outside of this... I don't even know the name of the bar. I think it's called, like, Reds or something. It's this one bar where all the drunken assholes who leave the XL Energy Center from a hockey game go. And I believe on this night, a hockey game had also gotten out. So there's, like, a lot of drunk foot traffic downtown. Well, I pull up in front of this bar, and I'm waiting, and it's, like, 11.30 midnight, somewhere in there. And the woman comes out, who's bought the ride... And she gets in the back seat, and, you know, she's very drunk. She's, she's telling me she's a bartender. And she's got a friend coming out, too. Or she's got two friends coming out. So I have to wait. So I'm not really saying anything to her. I start the trip, and she's not going very far in St. Paul. And I'm sitting, and I'm waiting, and, and, like, I'm not talking to this woman. And finally, the friend comes out, and the friend is really drunk. And the friend tells us first that we have to keep waiting because there's a third one coming. And so this friend starts trying to talk to me, and I, like, I just don't want to talk. And I can tell this girl is type B Minnesota nice. I can tell they both are. And so my patients are so thin from being impressed upon all evening that I just want nothing to do with this girl. So she's asking why I have, like, how I got the BMW. Is it my dad's? 
And I think, okay, you know what? Let's see if I can bounce you out of this car. So I look in the rear view and I see the one who's more sober who bought the ride is like distracted with her phone. So I reach into my seat and I grab a bottle of water and I whirl around and I give this woman the fucking craziest, most serial killer stare I can muster. And I go, might I interest you in a water? And like I go like kind of wide eyed and I'm like kind of slowly pushing the bottle toward her face like as as my eyes are getting wider and this my god i scared the drunk out of her words her lip quivers and she attempts to like like tap her friend be like you know hey there's a fucking psycho driving us but she can't even get herself to talk she's just her friend's name is trish trish and like right as her friend looks up i blinked and like you know i wipe this expression off my face it was just like a totally normal expression and she like that scared her even more how quickly i can go from zero to 60 back to zero and she just goes oh oh my oh my god oh my fucking god this this fucking guy oh my god and she just flies out of the car doesn't even bother closing the door just gone and so i looked at her friend and i looked at her friend like i think your friend's crazy i didn't even say that i just looked at her like very puzzled and she's very puzzled because she didn't see anything of what I did. And so she's looking at me, looking back at her friend, like a friend going back into the bar, just like shaking her head, hands in the air. And I go, you have interesting friends. And she apologizes to me. And she's embarrassed now. She goes, you know what? Just just take me home. I'm done with this tonight. So I play it off like not like it was totally her friend. I don't know what just happened. And meanwhile, I have like the biggest grin as I'm driving. So when we get to this woman's house... She, again, profusely apologized for the way that her friend behaved, and she tipped me $5. These trips where, in one way or another, I get back on the passenger that I don't like. Um, these were these were just my favorite trips, so I got another one. Maybe you won't think it's quite as funny as I do. I thought it was pretty fucking funny. So this trip, this next one, is called The Burst Bubble, and it's trip 4007. So I came to form various opinions about certain restaurants that I don't necessarily even dine at, just in seeing the clientele who does dine there, who I would pick up, that's how I would form an impression. So the best example I could think of is Burt's Steakhouse, which I've been to the bout before. Another one, which I guess I do kind of like dining there because they have a cool rooftop and it's fun to go downtown, Union, which is downtown Minneapolis. So Union attracts uh, wealthy, snobby clientele quite a bit. Whenever I go there, it's like yuppie lawyers or businessmen that make a kajillion dollars or uh, that one bitch. Who's that? Who's that? right-wing bitch tommy loren i think that's her name she was there over the summer and someone threw a drink on her okay so maybe not everyone who goes there is bad because somebody had the courage to throw a drink on tommy loren but still by and large i don't like the people that go there so okay so back to the rides here another indicator is on friday night and saturday night there's always like you don't see that many nice cars in minnesota and there's always a line like a caravan of bentleys and rolls royces and like lamborghinis and stuff outside of this place so I roll up, it's the winter, it's a Saturday night, and I'm waiting for Natalie. And so she finally comes out, and she's with this dude. Both of them, like, they look like they're, like, cutouts from a magazine. They both, like, they're just beautiful people. And from the time that I get, I virtually don't exist. I'm the help, I'm there doing a job, I say, because they're going from downtown to uptown. I confirm the address, no one really says anything, so I just start driving. And I'm listening to Natalie complain about Minneapolis and how she and Jay should just Pack up and move to L.A. already. Come on, Jay. Your dad has the penthouse, and he doesn't even use it. But Jay is quick to point out, no, babe, there's no hockey in L.A. Where am I going to skate at? So I'm listening to these two, and I'm just rolling my eyes because they're so unappreciative of all that they have. And admittedly, I've mentioned before, my family went broke. I used to be rich, and now I'm not. And I miss that a lot. And it really made me appreciate having things. So I guess in a way it was a good thing that it happened to me. But boy, I sure miss having a lot of money. And I'll tell you, when, when I would have passengers in my back seat who clearly had never wanted for anything in their life and they were complaining, it's like, no, you don't know how good you have it. Fuck you, man. Well, luckily, an opportunity to say fuck you presented itself in a much more subtle way. For whatever reason, the subject turned to Natalie talking about how awesome she is and how much people love and adore her. And she goes, I even have five stars as an Uber passenger. Isn't that right, driver? She calls me driver, and I'm thinking to myself, um, we prefer plebeian. Thank you very much. So one thing that I had noticed before the ride started, Natalie had a terrible passenger score. Most people don't fall below 4.5. I mean, if there's anybody below 4.6, 
when they got in the car, I could usually see why that was. Like, it was pretty immediately apparent to me. 4.5 is really bad. Once you get below 4.5, I mean, it's, like, not even subtle. So, from the time she got in, I think she was, like, 4.2 or something. She had one of the lower scores that I had seen. And from listening to her, it was apparent to me why that was. I bet other drivers were fed up with her snotty attitude. An evil grin crept across my face, and I said, Actually, Natalie, I'm sorry, but that's not true. And it was like I had uttered the most offensive thing any of them had ever heard. There was just this sudden quiet in the car. And she goes, Um, excuse me? Like, now she's looking Now she's looking at me. You know, I wasn't worth her attention before. Now that I'm clarifying, people don't like her. Now she's looking at me. So I go, Yeah, actually, Natalie. And, like, I pulled up the score on a show. I go, You got a 4.2. This is one of the worst scores I've ever seen. And she just... She cannot believe it. She is aghast. She's like, excuse me? Jay, Jay, how is this possible? And Jay's like, whatever, babe. Who cares? Just some stupid rating on an app. It's like, no, Jay, I am always five stars in everything. I do wonderfully in everything. How could someone rate me poorly? And I go, well, you know, you were probably just drunk or something. I'm keeping it very broad to leave it a mystery because I know that's going to bother her even more. Then Jay goes, yeah, see, babe, who cares? And she goes, who cares? I care. Jay, it's ranking me. I'm not ranked well. It was like this reality that she's not five stars was something that had never happened to her in her life. And she, her mind could scarcely cope with the reality of it. So now I'm thinking to myself, oh, this, like, this is just B5 hit and sunk. This whole evening, I bet, is going to be fucked up from what I've said. Because this girl is getting so upset. And this guy's trying to calm her down. And he can't because she's getting more and more upset. So I throw in because I'm thinking to myself, if I can get you to tip me on top of shipwrecking your night, you snotty little bitch. Oh my god, that's a hat trick in my book. I say, well, you know, if you ever want to secure a five-star rating, you just have to tip your Uber driver. Chances are, even if the driver didn't like you, for whatever reason it might be, if you're tipping them, they want you in their car again. Well, she spends the rest of the ride in utter hysteria that she's not five stars. There's an episode of Black Mirror on Netflix where, like, everyone rates each other. And so, like, no matter what you do, you always get a rating and it goes up and down. And it, it shows how destructive that is to society. But I would almost like that society... Just to watch a person like this see their score drop. Because if she's reacting like this over an Uber rating, when we arrived at their... Of course, they're in one of these cookie-cutter luxury apartments. Well, we arrived there, and she goes flying out of the car. She doesn't even wait for her boyfriend. And her boyfriend's like, Natalie! Like, calling after her. He doesn't even say bye or anything. He just jumps out of the car and goes running in after her. So I'm thinking, like, okay, I ruined your night. I for sure ruined your night with that. You're probably not going to even have sex with your boyfriend because you're going to be so upset. So I kind of ruined his night. I like that. But, you know, Natalie, if there's one, one thing you probably should have listened to, it was to heed my advice on tipping me. So guess what, Natalie? That rating is going down even more, bitch. I gave her one star. All right, shifting gears here. Back to the foreigners. So sometimes the humor wasn't the only difficult part of driving them. The fact that they did not understand me or my personality, and there was just no way that our personalities would mesh or or properly be able to communicate. Sometimes just the act of communication itself was so much of a barrier Lyft, at one point, announced a partnership with a Chinese company that's a ride-sharing company. I forget what it's called. But the way that it was structured, and I never put this to the test for myself, if I went to China, I could whip out my Lyft app, and it would pair me with drivers in China who are using this Chinese service and vice versa. Chinese people coming to America could use their Chinese app, and it would work through Lyft. So this only happened once. Uh, With this story that I want to talk about, It's called Lost in Translation. It's trip 1,908. And I just want to point out that one reviewer who was extremely critical of my book thought that this story was like a great story. It was enough to curb his opinion of the book to be slightly favorable instead of completely unfavorable. So the story goes, it's a weeknight in the summer of 2015. It's my first year of doing rideshare. And I pull up to... This uh, this apartment building in St. Paul, and I had I used to live there at this building, so I was kind of familiar with the area. Well, I'm waiting for Juan, W-A-N, and I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and finally after I'm like just about to cancel the ride, there's a tap on my window, and there's like a 20-something, uh, he's got to be Chinese, standing there with an elderly man and an elderly woman, both Chinese, and I roll down the window, and I go, hi, are you Juan? And he goes, yeah, uh, these are my parents. They don't live very far away. They don't speak any English. You're going to be taking them home. 
I asked them, do they speak any Japanese? Because I majored in it. And Chinese and Japanese people don't like each other. And you just, all you need to do is look at a history textbook and find out why that is. And it's still a sore subject, despite the fact that it was a World War II issue. Well, I suppose it went back further than World War II. But World War II was probably the biggest provocation between the two nations. Anyway, so asking a Chinese person if they speak Japanese or vice versa, it can be an offensive question, just the question itself. And the look on this guy's face, he just flatly goes, no. Like, okay, okay, E for effort, I tried. So they get in the car, the two parents, and we start driving, and he's got the destination loaded. He says, call me if there's a problem. The apartment building that we're driving to, it's only about a mile and a half, two miles away from where I picked these two up. So it didn't take very long to arrive there. But when we arrive there, it's a large complex. It's not like a solo building. It's a network of buildings, and there's a lot of them. And they're big, and it's just this big, spacious campus where this... Uh, like apartment village is so he entered in the broad village he didn't enter in which one they're at and so i'm driving through this giant like apartment complex building the building and the man and the woman in the back seat they're trying to talk to me but you know i don't speak chinese i don't know what the hell they're saying and so i'm trying to communicate to them that i that he didn't enter specifically which building to go to so the man's pointing one direction and getting animated in his pointing. And the woman's pointing in the other direction. And the two of them, they seem to be arguing with each other. And then they're kind of roping me into it too. But this whole, co- like, it's all in Chinese. So I'm just like, I, 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 the fuck do I say to you people? I don't know. I stop the car and I go, okay, we're calling Juan. I think they understood that I used his son's name because that gave them pause. So I dialed and of course he doesn't answer. And I dial again and of course he doesn't answer. So now I'm stuck. I'm b- driving in circles with these people, and they're they're getting so agitated, and they appear to still be arguing with each other, and their argument seems to be escalating because it's getting loud in this car. But finally, the phone rings, and it's one, and I pull over. I go, one, can you please tell your parents to calm down? I'm not sure which building specifically they're in. And so he says some Chinese over the phone, and they immediately they calm down, the two of them. And he looks at his phone. He goes, oh, crap, I'm so sorry. I put in the wrong address. I'm just like, are you are you kidding me? So I go, can you please communicate that to your parents so they stop yelling at me? So he says some more Chinese, and now they're chill. And the destination on the Uber app changes. And it's like, he wasn't even close. He put in a building that, like, they were, like, a mile away from this place that he put in. So I drive them to the right place. It's easy. It's, like, not even a big, like, it's not even, like, a big complex. It's, like, a solo building where they're supposed to be going. We arrive, and the woman gets out, and she says something in Chinese as she's getting out. I think she probably said thank you. Or she said, fuck you, white boy, one of the two. But she gets out. Closes the door. And then as the man's getting out, I go, have a good evening. And he says back to me in perfect English, thank you very much. His English was so perfect, it led me to believe that he was fucking with me the entire time and he spoke perfect English. I don't know. But it was was a silly encounter for sure. In another silly encounter, trip 3,180. So sometimes you didn't know for certain. You just kind of put together pieces and... Well, I mean, come on. Sometimes it was so suggestive that you could... I mean, there's no way that it's just your imagination. Come on. So in this one, you could usually tell when you're picking up strippers. It was a name like uh, Destiny or Crystal or something that sounded like a stripper. And then they're going to a strip club. I mean, come on. It's got to be. So in this case, and indeed, I, I, I am right because she confirmed she is a stripper. I'm driving a woman named, I think it was Destiny. And we're going to the Seville, which is a strip club downtown. She tells me she's on her way to work. So it's not a very long trip. She lives in the Northeast. And as we're driving there, she goes, do you mind if we stop at Whole Foods? i got to pick up a few things quickly. Sure, no problem. So I park in front of this Whole Foods on Washington Avenue in downtown Minneapolis. And this is where the fucking meter maids will get you. And I've ranted about meter maids before, how they're the scum of the earth. Well, I'm waiting for her to go in. And I decide I'm just going to circle the block because I see a meter maid sneaking up on me. Because they'll, like, even if your car is on and you're, like, about to leave, they'll still write you a ticket. And if you drive away, then you just get it in the mail. It's it's as ridiculous as it sounds. So I see one coming up, and I circle the block, and then, like, I circle again. And then I pull up, and I wait. And just as Destiny's coming out with a grocery bag, there comes a meter mate again trying to get me. It's like he has seen me and knows the game I'm playing and is waiting to try and get me. So she quickly, she gets in the car, you know, I yell at her, like, get in fast. And just as the meter maid gets out to start writing the ticket, I just 
take off and I put my middle finger out the window and I would do that so often to them. I hated them and still hate them so much. If you see a meter maid while you're driving tomorrow, do me a favor and just flip them off. There's a million jobs you could do. Why you got to do the job where you take a dump on people? Okay. So anyway, so I'm looking back as I'm driving away and I see Destiny has only purchased produce and fruit. She's purchased a zucchini, a banana, and a watermelon. Now, I understood what the first two were for, but unless she has a Gallagher routine going at this strip club, I shudder to think what was happening with that watermelon. Now, this next one wasn't even that bad. It was just more, the situation itself was really funny to me. This was on a night, it was in the summer, where my BMW was being serviced, and they gave me a brand new BMW as a loaner car. So I was out giving illegal rides uninsured in this, like, brand new BMW. So I'm out in, like, Plymouth, and I get a call at a hotel, and I'm driving. The guy's name is Malcolm. And as I'm pulling up to the hotel, before I even get on the grounds of the hotel, I see these two guys with their bags standing at, like, the edge of the property. And they flag me down, waving their phones, so I pull up for them. They tell me they're in town on business, and they are only here – they've only been here for two days, and they got a little weed. And so they – Malcolm and his his friend, who's also in this company, the whole company's staying at this hotel. Well, these two smoked some weed in their room, and they got a complaint, and they got kicked out of the hotel. The hotel threatened to call the cops on them for, like, a little fucking weed. It seemed ridiculous to me. And so they had to – their flight was leaving early in the morning, and it's, like, about 11 p.m. So they have to go to a motel, rent a room for just a couple of hours, right? And then they have to wake up at, like, 4.30. You know, they probably won't even go to sleep, they're saying. Sneak back to the hotel, somehow get in without anyone seeing them because they've been told they can't come back on the property. Assimilate and, like, go into their group with the rest of the company. Pretend like it, like nothing ever happened and leave with the company because the whole company is going to the airport together. Basically, they have to keep all of this a secret from their company. So it just – the situation was so funny, and I – I don't know how it turned out, if they got away with it or not, but it just seemed like such a crazy headache. And I still couldn't believe the hotel would get, like get this all up in arms about a little pot smoking. But speaking of substance and substance abuse, so sometimes you would hear all kinds of crazy stories about what people would do under the influence, one thing or another. And I mean, it was always like, you know, I had been there. I've, ha I've had so many silly, I wouldn't even call them silly, serious encounters just doing blunderous so stupid things when I'm drunk. You know, it happens to all of us. I like to drink. I still do drink. Uh, but just coming home some nights after witnessing how how much alcohol destroys people mentally and what it does to people, how stupid it makes people act, it would make me not want to drink. So in this story, it's trip 2157. It's called Off the Wagon. I'm outside of the Normandy Hotel. It's a Sunday afternoon, and I'm picking up a guy named Dan. So Dan comes out, he gets in the car, and he goes, hey, my boss is coming. Uh, they're going to the Target Center. Just give us a second here. She's had a rough night. So there's a country music, like a two-night thing going on. I don't like country music. And this guy tells me he works for one of the artists. I had never even heard of this guy's name. Like I said, it's country music in one ear and out the other. Not even. If it even enters my ears, it like kind of rots my brain a little bit. I hate it. In fact, I had quit prematurely the night before because I was so sick of picking up these people who went to this shitty concert that was like sold out. Because all they wanted to do, they were really drunk, everyone, when they got in the car. And even though the rates were like through the roof, they all wanted to play more country music. And they all wanted to sing along. And they all wanted to tell me about how awesome these country people are. And they would ask me if I knew the person. And I would say I didn't. And then they would be like, oh, my God, you don't know who blah, 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 blah is? So I had quit driving, but this guy's telling me how expensive uh, an Uber ride was like like an hour after this concert got out. He's like, you know this ride that we're taking here? And it was like a mile and a half long ride because they're going to the Target Center. This this ride here cost me almost $45 last night. I'm thinking like, oh, okay, you know what? Maybe I should have sucked it up. He goes on to say, it was such a wild night, though. We partied with the, the whatever the country star's name is, and he bought us all drinks and my manager, who's coming out, was 20 years sober until last night. And so then the doors to the Normandy Hotel open up. And this woman comes out who looks the very definition of somebody who's had the worst hangover of their life. She's got these sunglasses on. She's sweating heavily. Her hair is a mess. Her clothes are a mess. She's got a hand to her head. She's limping out of the hotel like she was anally raped by a gorilla. 
and she falls into the, she doesn't even like get to the car she basically falls in the back seat and she goes oh please don't drive too fast and don't hit any bumps i don't want to puke all over this nice car so this other guy dan is still just giving her shit and he tells me that in her drunken mess last night this woman who was 20 years sober hooked up with the bus driver because they had like the country star had like his own private tour bus that they were on she hooked up with the damn bus driver so we're driving now. We're going into the Target Center, and it was kind of cool because I had never been, like... These guys, you know, they had VIP access and badges and stuff. So I got to go underneath the stadium and, like, see how, like, the baseball stars get to games and, like, where they park their luxury cars and stuff like that. So as we're pulling in, Dan taps my shoulder and goes, Evan, right there! That's the one she fucked last night. And she's pointing at this guy who's, like... Oh, God, he must have been about 300 pounds. Look like a carny. And this woman, I mean, this woman wasn't exactly a supermodel herself, but this is definitely a drunken mistake. Like, it is a very, very mismatched pair for hooking up. So he goes, here, I'll give you five bucks if you beep the horn. So immediately I take his money and I just beep the horn. This woman is mortified. She puts, she's wearing a hat. She puts her hat down and goes scurrying away from the car to like just try and run away from this guy. I turned back to Dan and I go, you know, something tells me that's all the motivation she needs for never drinking again. All right, I have two more stories before we conclude the episode, but before we do, I want to do something I have never done before in this podcast. So all this comes, all these stories and everything, it all comes from my little black book, the little diary that I kept all these Uber stories logged on. And sometimes the rides weren't that interesting, but what was said was so amazing, I had to write down the quote. So I'm going to share some quotes with you guys. I've never done this before in my books or anywhere else. I do it on my my uh, Ubered Books Twitter handle. But here are some quotes that I collected that I think are hilarious. Look at that skunk, says one passenger. The other one says back, Colin, that skunk is someone's daughter. Two bottoms don't make a top. It's in the Rainbow Bible. Gay Genesis. You know, leaving Las Vegas, the flight home, is one of the worst aspects of the human experience. Evan, do you do cocaine? You have a great nose for it. My wife said she thinks I'm cheating on her. I told her she sounds like my girlfriend. We're exes with benefits, one passenger tells me. And I ask, is it, is it overly intrusive to ask how things ended? And she huffs and she goes, very. And it's like, well, why the fuck would you tell me that then? Of course I'm going to ask that. Every time I have ever seen Peter, I ended up seeing his dick. I've even seen him taking a shit before. His girlfriend even tried to fight me once. I don't know who Peter is, but that's all the information I got about them, and that allowed me to construct what I think is an accurate mental image of who Peter is and what he looks like. Dude, you got fired from a Walmart. That's the place that hires the mentally handicapped. How do you do that? And the other guy goes, I got caught smoking crystal. Nobody in Greece wears watches. They don't have time for it. Now, the thing is, is that guy said that without realizing what he said or how funny I thought what he said was. Now, my hair, my hair looks like the burning bush from the Bible. In Russia, we don't wear seatbelts. I'm thinking like, yeah, I know. I've seen the videos meanwhile in Russia. It's Valentine's Day. Time to get knee deep in some strange. Tinder is different for guys and girls. For girls, you get matched with everyone. For guys, it's like 1 in 50. And they never message you. It's a surefire way to feel like Shrek. Holy fuck. I just had a duck sausage that was so good I wanted to go back in the kitchen and blow the chef. Easily the most delicious thing that has been in my mouth in six months. I was living in my van at the time. It was basically recreational poverty. It was great. Passenger 1 says, How old are you? Are you even old enough to drive? Passenger 2 says, maybe he's got that Benjamin Button disease. You, sir, have restored my faith in UberX. Usually I get picked up in a shitty Chevy and it's being driven by a child molester. God, I just want to punch my mother-in-law in the fucking throat. And let me tell you, that was easily the most delicious penis I have ever sucked. The seven-year-old that I was babysitting called me woman and demanded cookies. Of course I have a dog. I'm a lesbian. Duh. I buy the toilet paper that has the puppy on the package. But now I have this weird connotation with shitting and puppies. But what I like so much about Uber cabs is I don't need to be current on my vaccinations before getting into the car. They were playing and the dog had a heart attack. Good riddance, I hated that fucking dog. 
When I can't get myself to throw up, I lick the bowl of the toilet. Some people just shouldn't drive. People ask me why I don't drive, and I just say, you're welcome. Adults ask children what they want to be when they grow up because they themselves are short on ideas. And the last one. Five people came up to me in the span of four minutes and asked me whose father I am. I'm never going to a college bar again. Okay, that's just a little sample of the quotes that'll be in the Ubered Special Edition, which will be out this summer. And again, the Ubered Special Edition is going to be both books put together, plus all kinds of bonus material, stories I've never shared, quotes, etc. Okay, final two stories. This first one is called Your Chariot Awaits Its Trip 3992. It's a rainy day, I'm at a gas station, and I'm damn lucky to have made it to the gas station because my gas gauge had been on empty for quite a while. I was kind of seeing how far I could push it, and it was getting a little scary. So I'm filling up, I'm waiting, it's raining, and this shitty 1999 Escalade comes rolling into the pump across me. And this dude, he looks like a douchebag. Got the Detroit Lions cap on, it's backwards, kind of stocky. White guy with some shitty facial hair. Well, he gets out, and he's like yelling at the person in the car. It's like mid-argument as he gets out of the car. And so he starts filling up the pump, and he's still yelling at this girl, and she's yelling back at him. And finally, she jumps out of the car, and she goes, Oh, hell, you know what, Jay? Fuck you, man. I'm sick of your cheating ass. I'm tired of putting up with this shit. My sister was right about you. And so they're, like this argument is getting very animated, and it's on the other side of the pump from me. So I hear this guy go, What are you doing? And she goes, Fuck this, man. I'm a Uber up out of here. Fuck you. And I whip out my phone and I quickly turn on, because I had shut the app off while I was getting gas. I turn it on, and right as I turn it on, her call, like her Uber request, came through on my phone. And I tapped it, and I step around the other side of the pump, and I go, Uber for Mariah? And she looks, and she like can't believe that I'm right there. And so right as this happens, my car, it's like perfect harmony. My car finishes filling up. The pump clicks, and I quickly hang it back up. And she, this guy's like pleading with her not to go. And I go, Madam, your chariot awaits. And I open the door for her, and she gets in back, and he's still pleading with her. And I look at him, and I close the door for her, and I go, back the fuck off. And this guy was, like, so put off by me suddenly, like, exhibiting hostility to him that he froze in place. So I get back in the car, and she's so, she can't believe that this happened. I, in my head, I can't believe this happened either. This is, like, all just perfect timing. She goes, five motherfucking stars. And I look back at her, and I go, you're goddamn right. And the... Final story, listeners, now that I'm realizing it, I didn't even write about it. It should have been in the unwritten accounts, but it's funny, and it escaped my mind when I made that episode, so now you get it. This is actually one of the last Uber trips that I ever took. It's called Big Daddy Caddy, and I don't even have the trip number. It's probably it's probably like trip 7800 or something around that. So, quick recap, I went through four different cars in my four years of doing rideshare. Three of them were BMWs, and my last car, my quote-unquote cheapest car, was a 2006 Cadillac STS with a V8, and that actually might be... No, you know what? The Z3 was my favorite car that I've ever owned. This is a close second. I love this Cadillac. I would strongly recommend picking one up. I got it for when all was said and done, I got a warranty, I paid about $8,500, it had 120,000 miles, fully loaded, black on black, tinted windows, it's got a rear spoiler that's like very discreet, it's like a, it's a fucking gangster's car, it's the most badass car. When I bought it, I bought it from the world's sketchiest car salesman, he's like the closest thing I've ever seen to used car salesman Gil from The Simpsons. This guy was just dripping in desperation when, when I went to go see the car, and his uh, quote unquote dealership. It was more like a chop shop. It was this sketchy, like, warehouse in this, like, weird crumbling strip mall in this rural suburb. And to get to the car, like, it was like a maze of cars. There were there were so many cars packed into this tiny little garage. And they had to move them all out because his car was in the middle. Well, yada, yada. I'm repeating the story from the first episode. But I got the car. And it's an awesome car. I've only put, like, twenty three or 24,000 miles on it. And I have no intention of selling it. I'm going to keep it. Anyway, so... When I first got this car, as I'm driving, like I finished signing the paperwork and I put down a down payment, blah, 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 and I'm driving uh, back to Minneapolis, and I realized, oh, shit, this car's not insured. So I got off the highway, because knowing me, somebody's going to fucking rear end me or something, and I sit in this like random neighborhood, and I'm like waiting to get an insurance quote, and so right after I get the car insured, like I've been sitting there for like 40 minutes, like calling different uh, different companies, 
Well, I get, I gotta finally get the car insured. All it's said and done, and I look in the rear view mirror at myself, and for whatever reason, I go, "That's right, baby. You call me Big Daddy Caddy." So I created this this persona, this character, and it's the character is basically a man who has he's much like me, like like a not a pimp, not a hard uh, street thug, but he suffered a concussion. And so now he thinks that he's this, like, hardened pimp. His name is Big Daddy Caddy. He's a pimp. He's the toughest motherfucker in that fixed one, too. But he's got brain damage. So I would, I would like, build this mythology of this character throughout my driving experiences. And so one night, because, like, you know, there were a few times where passengers were pissing me off. And I would snap at them, but I'd do it in the Big Daddy Caddy voice. i go, Hey, you watch your fucking mouth play, boy. I'm going to pull over and kick you the fuck out of this car. The guy's like, is this guy serious? Like, is this guy serious? Motherfucker, you know what? Somebody talk bad about my mama. I put my snakeskin boots so far off that motherfucker, the asshole. Like that movie Alien, a goddamn reptile coming out of his stomach. Try me. Try me. And as you can imagine, the rest of the ride was silence. But no, that's not the story. So the story here, it's a Friday night. It's cold. It's uh, like January, February, somewhere in there. It was before the Super Bowl. And I'm in Maplewood, and I pick up a car full of people. It's four people getting in. Three of them are in their 20s. They're, like, around my age. They're all very drunk. And the fourth one, I assume, is someone's dad. It's, like, this dude's, like, in his mid-60s, and this dude is really drunk. And it's not even that late, either. It's only, like, 9 p.m. So the three younger ones all work at this bar, and the older one is a patron who basically lives there. And this guy is like, this guy is so fucked up, I can't tell if he's on crystal meth, or if he's drunk, or if he's on heroin, or what the deal is. It's like, he's trying to talk, but it, it, he's, his motor skills and mouth, like, everything has been so bastardized by alcohol, or whatever the fuck he's on, that it's just like, it's not like he's speaking orc. It's just like snorts and grunts and like, <laughs> but he's like, he's communicating with these people and they seem to speak his language or drunken ease or whatever the fuck it is. But here's the deal. I have been in such a bad mood the whole night because I'm like annoyed that I've ended up in Maplewood or Maple Grove. I'm in Maple Grove. I'm sorry. I'm so annoyed that I've ended up in Maple Grove that I did not even look at these people when they got in the car. I just like, I just want to be done for the night already. So I did like. I didn't see that this guy is old. I like I just I see the person who got into the front seat is a young person and I hear voices that sound young from the back and it's dark. So when I'm looking in the back rear view mirror, I'm not really seeing much of their faces. So this guy, I mean, he sounds just very conspicuous to me. Well, we stop at a gas station and I get out to fill up to put some gas in my car and the car unloads and everyone gets out and I see this old guy gets out and I go, oh, my God, you're an old man. And, like, it just kind of came out. And this guy was so, like, he, you know, he, I don't know how much cognition is going on in his head. But he heard this part. He looks at me, like, he looks at me sideways. And he goes, eh, fuck, excuse me, I'm an old, fuck you, young man. So he goes into the gas station muttering swear words. I get back in the car, and I'm, like, everyone in the car is laughing hysterically that I've called him an old man. And he gets back in the car, and he's just, he's pissed. But he's, again, he's so fucking drunk. That he can barely form a retaliation against me because he wants to like try and insult me, so he keeps he keeps calling me a, a nothing but a fart in the wind. That's the only thing that I can distinctly pick up from him. And finally, I get so fed up with him trying to like insult me and like provoke me that I turned into Big Daddy Caddy. Go, motherfucker! You listen to me. You listen good. You call me Big Daddy Caddy, Captain, a nothing at all, motherfucker. Do I make myself clear? And I haven't even looked back in the rear view. I've just kind of yelled this and, like, transformed into this character. And the whole car, the car is very amused both with me and with the situation. So there's, like, maybe three, four seconds of silence. And then I hear from the back seat, Big Daddy Caddy. <laughs> and everyone just starts laughing. And I look in the rear view and I go, yes, my thumb, what can I do for you? Goes, Big Daddy, Big Daddy Caddy, how'd you get to be so mean? And I go, I was born under an unlucky star. Let me act you something, playboy. How you get to be such a goddamn train wreck on two feet. So this agitates him again, and he starts trying to re-insult me. But again, he just, his mouth can't produce insults to save his life. So I just kind of tune him out, and I'm now talking to, I stopped the Big Daddy Caddy act. And he's still calling me Big Daddy Caddy. He has been told, if he calls me anything but Big Daddy Caddy, 
on throwing his bitch ass on the side of the road and leaving him. So this woman in the front seat is a bartender at this bar. She's apologizing profusely. Apparently, this guy like lives at the bar, like I said, and, and these bartenders are buying the ride home for him because his life is hard. Because the guy's just like a like an alcoholic. He's like Frank Gallagher from, from Shameless. Times three. We're dropping this guy off first. And so we, we've, been, you know, we've been in the car for like 15 minutes. Well, we pull into this like shitty neighborhood. It's not a trailer park. It's like maybe two notches up. And we, I'm surprised that he's not living in a homeless shelter, this guy. We drop him off like at his house. And his I noticed in his driveway, he's got three or four cars. And so as he's getting out of the car... I go, there is, I'm thinking to myself, like, there's no fucking way that he has a driver's license. I bet he's got at least two DUIs. So as soon as he's gone, I go, you mean to tell me that guy has a valid driver's license? And everyone in the car laughs, and they go, no, he's on his fourth or fifth DUI. But listeners, that's going to do it for this edition of the Ubered Podcast. I'm your host, Evan Kale. I'm going to remind you guys, as always, I have three books out. Ubered My Life as a Rideshare Driver, Ubered 2, and Wolf in the Jungle. And if you live in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, the Hennepin County Library now carries all of my books. Finally, I am going to be doing a Q&A with you guys. Tweet your questions at me or direct message me or use the hashtag Ubered Podcast, and I'm going to be answering them on the final episode, which will be airing in the spring. And also, if you have time, and again, I know you have fucking time, you're listening to this, please rate my show on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. I would really appreciate it. Listeners, you have been Ubered. I'm Evan Kale. Signing off.